This is White Oak Worship Center in Blairs, Virginia. Our vision is to provide a place for hurting, broken people to find love, forgiveness, and encouragement. A place to help develop people to spiritual maturity through Bible study, training courses, and small group ministries. A place to help every believer discover their God-given gifts, talents, and callings. It's our desire to strengthen families and to be a blessing to all who come our way. And now, White Oak Worship Center in Blairs, Virginia. Well, before we pray, we're going to do our baby dedication at this time, and then we'll all go to the Lord in prayer. So I'm going to ask Kristen and, and Andrew, Drew, if they would come at this time and bring little Isabella, Kay, Moran, and all the family. You're welcome to come and stand right here in the front. Amen. Give this family a hand as they all come this morning. <clears throat> Amen. I love it when you have packed three pews for a baby dedication. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Drew, we'll get y'all to stand right here in the middle, and the family can get on each side of y'all. Amen. Weston, it seems like it was just yesterday we did your baby dedication. You're doing all right, buddy. Coming on with the program. Amen. Sister Charlene, it's so good to see her, and she was on our prayer list too, and we heard you got a miracle, girl. That's what we heard. Three miracles, three miracles. You can't beat that. Some of y'all want to come on this side? You can? All righty. Good to see this precious family. Amen. We're going to get you where we can get you on camera here. All righty, all righty. At this time, I'd like for all of you to just direct your attention to these screens up here. Would you do that?
May the world not ensnare or change who you are. And may the light that's within you shine like the stars. May angels surround you, body, spirit, mind. May favor and peace be yours to find. May rejection and pain never reach you. May your spirit grow bold for what you're called to. As you rest in God's care, I will rest too, knowing that Jesus is watching over you. Amen. I love you, Mommy. Now, I'd like everybody to do this with me. Are you ready? Aww. <laughs> uh, that one with the food all over, that kind of reminded me of myself right there. <laughs> Amen. Well, Weston and Kristen and Andrew have come today to dedicate little Isabella K. Moran to the Lord. And I've said this so many times, it was custom in Bible times for the parents to bring their children to the temple to be presented before the Lord. Actually, Mary and Joseph did that very thing when they brought baby Jesus. And it was there, of course, that Simeon saw him and he took Jesus up in his arms and he blessed him and he said, Lord, now let thy servant depart in peace for mine eyes have they seen thy salvation. Also that day at the temple was the prophetess Anna and she also recognized the significance of baby Jesus and she gave thanks to the Lord. So we understand that it's fitting for parents to bring their children to church, to bring them to the altar and to present them before the Lord and ask God's blessings to be upon them their entire life. I've said this so many times, if what this family is doing today and any of us it, that, that does this, if it means something to you, how many of you know it means something to God? Amen, it really does. I've often said that baby dedications are more for the family than they are for the baby. Uh, I was talking to someone the other day. I won't say who they were, Sandra. I mean, I didn't say that, did I? <laughs> but I said, you know, we should name them instead of baby dedications, parent dedications and family dedications because really it's our responsibility to train and to teach a child in the way that that child should go. Amen? So it's very important that we understand the responsibility that we have as a family to live a life before our children that exemplifies Jesus Christ. When they see us, they should see Jesus in us, amen? So our responsibility that we have, as long as they're in our care, is teaching and training that child. The scripture's very clear on that. And there's a difference between teaching and training. I've shared this so many times. Teaching is an impartation of information, while training is the application of information. There's a gentleman by the name of Wilfred Peterson. He said this, and he, he actually wrote a book on the art of parenthood. And over the years, I've shared this with so many families. But I love some of the things that he said in this book. He said, in practicing the art of parenthood, and how many of you know that parenthood is an art? <laughs> it really is. He said, in practicing the art of parenthood, I love this. He said, an ounce of example is worth a ton of preachment. Did y'all get that? An ounce of example is worth a ton of preachment. In other words, it's not what you say, it's what you do. That's why we have that responsibility to live it in front of our kids. He went on to say, our children are watching us live and what we are shouts louder than anything that we can say. He said, when we set an example of honesty, our children will be honest. When we practice tolerance, they will be tolerant. When we demonstrate good sportsmanship, they will be good sports. When we meet uh, life with laughter, and a twinkle in our eye, they will develop a sense of humor. When we are thankful for life's blessings, they will be thankful. When we express friendliness, they will be friendly. When we speak words of praise, they will praise others. When we confront failure, defeat, and misfortune with a gallant spirit, they'll learn to live bravely. When our lives affirm our faith in the enduring values of life, they will rise above doubt and skepticism. When we surround them with love and the goodness of God, they will discover life's meaning. When we set an example of, of heroic living, they will be heroes. And I love this. He said, don't just stand there pointing your finger to the heights of what you want your children to scale. 
Start climbing and they will follow. Amen. Start climbing and they will follow. Well, in the book of Mark, chapter 10, verses 13 through 18, the word says this. It says, they brought young children to him that he should touch them, talking about Jesus. And his disciples rebuked those that brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased. And he said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of God. And then Jesus went on to say, Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. And then the word says, He took them up in his arms, he put his hands upon them, and the word says that he blessed them. That's what baby dedication is. It's when we bring our children to the altar. It's when we place our hands upon that baby and we present that baby before the Lord and ask God's blessings to be upon that child. And that's what we're going to do right now. Drew, get my hands warmed up. Hi, Isabella. How you doing, darling? Let me get you like this. Yeah, this pastor's learned some things over the years. If you're going to throw up, it's going that way. Amen. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, thank you for little Isabella. Thank you for her precious family, dear God. And we pray for each one that stands here today. Lord, knowing that we all will have a part in training and teaching this precious little girl. Thank you for blessing this family with two precious children, Lord. And God, just may their lives always exemplify Christ. May these children grow up saying, I know what it is about Christianity because I've seen it in my mommy and my daddy and my family. And that's what's so important. Now, Lord, as they bring her to the altar to present her to you today, we pray the blessings of God upon Isabella Kay from this day forward. We pray that you would bless her with good health and with good strength. And Lord Jesus, when she comes to an age of accountability, Lord, that she will turn her life completely and totally over to you. And Lord, that she'll live for you and be used mightily by you, dear Lord. Now let your anointing be upon this child and upon this family and bless them in the days, weeks, months, and years that come. And we'll thank you for everything you do. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I believe this one has done better than any child I've ever dedicated. Most of them's done, had my microphone off and my glasses off by now. Isabella, you all right. Did they give you something before you come up here, honey? <laughs> A little drug. They got said we just drugged her up a little bit. <laughs> Bless you, darling. Mm -hmm. Amen. She's a darling. All right. I give her back to mommy. <laughs> Amen. We love you, and God bless this precious family, each one of y'all. And uh, just go on and have about ten more children. We'll be in good shape. <laughs> Amen. Drew, did you hear that? He said, no, I never heard a word. <laughs> Amen. Give this family a hand. God bless y'all. Oh, I love doing that. Boy, I tell you, after about a year, I, I could have been a bit, went about an hour on that baby dedication right there. That's just nothing but some good stuff. Amen. Water you turned into wine. Open the eyes of the blind There's no one like you None like you Into the darkness you shine Yes Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you
worship your name Jesus Can you feel him? All his presence Jesus We love the name of Jesus We love the name of Jesus Oh says they go down to the sea in ships that do business in great waters these see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep for he commandeth and raiseth the stormy wind which lifteth up the waves thereof they mount up to the heaven they go down again to the depths notice this their soul is melted because of trouble did you get that they reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at wit's end. Anybody here ever been at your wit's end? Listen now. Then, everybody say then. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he bringeth them out of their distresses. He maketh the storm, everybody say the storm, to calm, a calm, so that the waves thereof are still. Then are they glad because they be quiet. So he bringeth them into their desired haven. And I love verse number 31. He says, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wondrous works to the children of men. I'm going to stop there and I want to title the message, When in the storm of life. 
Let's pray. Father, thank you for the reading of the word. Thank you for the anointing on the word. Now that same anointing that's on your word, let it be upon your servant. Let this word go forth. May it minister to the hearts and lives of your children that are gathered here this morning and those who are live streaming today. Lord, we know there are storms that we go through in this life, but as long as you are on board our vessel, everything's going to be all right. Now, thank you for your presence. We pray if there's anyone here today who has not made their calling and election sure, if there's anyone here today who has never been born again or is in a backslidden condition, may this be the day they run up the white flag and surrender their life to you. I ask this in Jesus' name. And everyone who is in agreement with me, shout it. Amen, amen and amen. This scripture talks about a storm. But you know what? It's not just a physical storm, but I believe it's a spiritual storm also. How many of you can say and be honest today, over the last year, you've kind of been in a storm? It's the storms of life that we go through. The Lord never said that it was going to be easy. He never said that everything would be wonderful. Just give your heart to the Lord and you'll never have another problem. He never said anything like that. There are storms that we go through, and I've said many times, we're going to go through, we're going to go through things in this life. We're going to come out as either gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, or stubble. So we've got to understand that. You've got to arm yourselves and be ready because there's a battle that's coming all the time. We are going to be in battle from the moment that we come to know Jesus to the moment that we leave this world or the trumpet of God sounds. Fact of the matter is, there's a battle that we're going on that's going on all the time. And what we see here, let me read this to you from the NLT. It reads like this. It says, some went off to sea in ships, plying the trade routes of the world. They too observed the Lord's power in action, his impressive works on the deepest seas. He spoke and the winds rose, stirring up the waves. Their ships were tossed to the heavens and plunged again to the depths. The sailors cringed in terror. How many of you have ever been through things you just, you cringed in terror? This morning in the early service, Brother Randy and Terry Johnson were here this morning. And I went with Randy a few years ago out to Oklahoma City. It was the first time that I had seen with my own two eyes the devastation that comes when a tornado comes through. I'd seen pictures of it, but I'd never seen it with my own two eyes. And I was there, and I saw the devastation and the things that took place. And it was amazing how that on one side of the street, it looked like nothing had happened there at all. Houses were still intact. Trees weren't blown over. On the other side of the street, everything was gone, leveled. A lot of places, it was just the, just the foundation that was left there. And there are things, folks, that we go through in this life that makes us cringe. Come on, spiritually speaking. And it says that the sailors, they cringed in terror. And it goes on to say they reeled and staggered like drunkards and were at their wits end. How many of you have ever come to your wits end? I mean, you said, this is it. I don't know what to do. I've done everything I know to do, God. I, I don't know what to do. But this is the case. And sometimes when you, go, when you go through the storms of life, folks, you come to your wits end. Some throw the towel in, some quit, some give up. Some, it just makes them mad, amen? It's all right just to get mad at the devil. Can I get a witness out there? But the word says they came to their wits end. And here's the wonderful thing. In verse 28, they said, Lord, help. <laughs> Lord, help. Did you get that? King James says, then they cried unto the Lord. What do they cry? Lord, help. Anybody got to that place when you said, God, I've done all I know to do. Know to do. Lord, help me. Lord, help, this is what they said. And then it goes on to say, they cried in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. And I love verse 29. He calmed the storm to a whisper and stilled the waves. How many of you know he can calm the storm that's going on in your life? He can calm it to a whisper. He can calm those waves, can he? He can. And then it says in verse 30, what a blessing was that stillness as he brought them safely into harbor. And then he says in verse 31, let them praise the Lord for his great love and for the wonderful things that he has done for them. How many of you have got something to praise the Lord for today? Though the things that he's brought us through, the storms that he's helped us to endeavor and to get through and to make it out, we've got something to praise the Lord for today. Now, there are a lot of people that's in a storm today, still in a storm. Still in a storm. We have a lot of people who haven't come back yet. They're still in a storm. And there are people that are here. You're just going through some things. And, but I'm telling you that Jesus, folks, he can calm the storm in your life. He really can. The Bible tells us over here in the book of, let's see, I believe it's in, in Mark chapter 6. It tells us about another storm that Jesus was in. 
And let, let me read it to you. It's found in Mark chapter 6, beginning in verse 45. It says, And straightway, Jesus, what he did, he constrained his disciples to get into the ship and go to the other side before unto Bethsaida. While he, went, while he sent them away, away the people. The word says, and when he had sent them away, he departed into the mountain to pray. How many of you know there's times we just need to get alone with God? Because basically he's the only one who really understands what we're going through. A lot of people say, I know what you're going through, you know, maybe to a certain degree. But the Lord is the only one that really knows what we're going through. So he went, he went and he departed unto them in the mountain to pray. And the word says, when even was come, that the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land. Here he is. He's on the land. The disciples are out there in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. Now, the word says in verse 48, and he saw them. Now, how could he see them? He was on the land. <laughs> but he saw them toiling in rowing. For the wind was contrary unto them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he cometh unto them walking upon the sea and would have passed them, passed by them. But when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed they had, they had seen a spirit and they cried out. For they all saw him and they were troubled and immediately he talked with them and he said to them, listen to what he said, be a good cheer, it is I, be not afraid, amen? And then he says, he, and he went up into them, into the ship, and the wind ceased and they were sore amazed uh, and they, they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure, and they wondered. Verse 20, 52 says, For they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. Now, what are we talking about? We're talking about when you go through the storms of life. And as we look in these scriptures that we have read to you, when you go through the storms of life, one thing that we need to understand as children of God, listen to me, is that Jesus, Jesus sees the problem. See, a lot of times we think nobody understands. Nobody knows what I'm going through. Jesus sees your problem. Look with me here in verse 48 that we just read to you. It says, and he saw them toiling in rowing. Let me stop right there. He what? He saw them toiling in rowing. And you see, in the storm, we're not unnoticed. When you're going through a storm, guess what? You're not forgotten. The Lord knows what you're going through. He really does. Jesus reminds us that he, listen, if he can see a little bird, a sparrow fall to the ground, he knows everything about that. How many of you believe that he knows everything that you and I are going through when we are in an uncontrollable storm? I mean, if he loves a bird enough to know when a sparrow falls, guess what? He knows about you. He knows about me today. He really does. Amen. See, in 1 Peter 3, 12, the word says that the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. It says that his ears are open unto their prayers, doesn't it? That's what it says. In other words, the eyes of the Lord, guess what? They have always been over his people. They have always been over us. And he will not, I love what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. He said, he will not suffer us to be tempted more than we are able to bear, but shall therewith make a way of escape. How many of you know he allows us to go through things, Shirley? But listen to me, he will make a way of escape for you and me. When you've come to your wit's end, when you're ready to throw the towel in, when you're ready to give up, guess what? He'll be there right there when you need him. I can testify that's true. Over 51 years of serving God, I can tell you he's been there at my darkest time. Amen? He really has. We look at Israel when they were in bondage in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 7. The Bible says, and the Lord said, now listen to what he says to these people who have been in slavery for 430 years. He, said, he says this, I, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt. Now listen to what he says, I have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters. How many of you know that the devil is a hard taskmaster? Hey Amen. He, dem he, he demands more and more uh, of you as your life goes by and gives back less and less. He's a hard taskmaster. And then he say, goes on to say, he says, I have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters. And then this, I love this. He says, for I know their sorrows. Did you get that? I know their sorrows. See, Jesus sees your problem. He knows about it, folks. He knows everything. Well, why hasn't he come to my rescue? Hold on. Put your seatbelt on. Don't fall out of the pew. We're going to get to that. Amen? What are you saying? I'm saying when we're in the storm of life that he sees the problem. He also can deal with the wind. He really can. Look here at verse 48 again. He saw them toiling and rowing. And notice this. For the winds were contrary unto them. Let me stop right there. How many of you ever been in the wind and it was contrary to you? In other words, you were trying to go in one direction with the wind was blowing and you weren't making really good time. 
Brother Cowboy, it's really hard to hit a golf ball up into the wind, isn't it? Amen? Those 370-yard drives you have end up only being 125. <laughs> Amen? I lied on two things there. Number one, he don't hit the ball that far. And number two, I ain't ever seen him hit it that less either. Amen? But now on me, it's different. <clears throat> we won't go there. <laughs> Cavill said, thank you very much. Contrary to the wind, can I get a witness out there? When we get contrary to the wind, that, that, that listen, that, the, the Lord's the only one who can deal with that. See, in the storm, it, it, as you notice here, notice what it says. He saw them toiling and rowing, and the winds were contrary to them. And it was, notice this, it was about the fourth watch of the night, he comes unto them walking upon the sea. See, in the storm, even in the fourth watch of the night, and what is that? That's the worst part of the storm just before the sunrise. That's, a, that's the, for, the fourth watch of the night. What do we learn? We learn that Jesus is there, even in your worst moment. Mama Joyce, even when they say you got cancer and you ain't going to make it, come on, honey. In your worst hour, come on. Are you, Kathy, when, when it looks like you might go blind from those shingles that you had, it's your worst moment in your life. Guess what? That's when Jesus shows up. Amen. He's able to execute the impossible. This is what he's able to do. See, the master, he can walk. Not only does he walk on the sea, he can walk on our problems too. How many of you know he can walk right over top of the problem that you're going through in your life? This is what he can do. Amen. This is what he can do. He does what man with all of his knowledge has never done. Man thinks he knows it all. Most men are a legend of their own mind. But I'm going to tell you one, when we put our faith in God and we give up and say, I can't do it, Lord, guess what? He can. He can. In Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20, it says this, Now unto him that is able, him that is able, listen to this, to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we could even begin to ask or think. Woo! That's shouting ground right there. How many of you know that the God we serve, he is able to do exceedingly and abundantly? How about I say more than enough? He can do more than enough, exceedingly and abundantly, above all that we could even begin to ask or think. This is what he can do, amen? I don't know about you, but I'm about ready to have church up here any moment now. That's the truth. <clears throat> he can deal with the winds, no matter what we're going through. We're all familiar. Everyone knows about the three Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace. We all know about that. It looked like all was lost, didn't it? I mean, it, it looked like these young men were going to die in those flames that they were thrown into. But the fourth man, Jesus, how many of you know he can deal with an impossible situation, even a fiery situation? He can take care of it. I love it. King Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 3, the, he, he asked him, he says, did not we throw three men in there? And in the word says here in Daniel chapter 3, verse 25, he answered and said, Lo, <laughs> I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Did we throw three men in? Well, look, there's four down there. How many of you know he's the fourth man in the fire with you? No matter what you're going through, no matter how contrary the wind is blowing, no matter what the devil tries to do, Jesus is there. He's going to take care of us. Amen? Amen. You see, when you're in the storm of life, now listen to this. This is going, this is going to throw some of you for a, a flip, but it, it's good, and you'll understand when we get there. When you're going through the storm of life, sometimes Jesus will pass you by. Did, what did you say? I said, sometimes he'll pass you by. See, there's a lot of you that's sitting under the sound of my voice today and live streaming today. You feel like Jesus has passed you by. You're thinking, God, you don't answer my prayers anymore. I haven't felt your presence in years, months, days, weeks. Anybody ever been there? Huh? Well, look here once again and look at verse 48. He saw them toiling and rowing, and the wind was contrary unto them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he come, notice this, he cometh unto them walking upon the sea. Now, this is what I want you to get. And would have passed them by. Did you get that? See, we always talk about these scriptures. Yeah, Jesus was walking on the water. But if you read on, the word says, and he would have passed them by. See, in the storm, Jesus will pass you by sometimes. What do you mean, preacher? He'll pass you by if you don't call out to him in prayer. He, he'll pass you by if you don't recognize that he's the only one that can save your life. Amen? See, most folks will try everything else before they try Jesus. They really will. They'll try everything before they try Jesus. And you know what? He'll pass you on by. 
he'll say, okay, if that's where your faith is, that's fine. Go ahead, go for it. Amen? Amen. This is what we see in the Word of God. See, passivity, folks, it can be your destruction. How many of you know it's a time to be passive and it's a time to be aggressive? And listen to me, if we need God, we need to get aggressive. Come on, we need to cry out to him with everything that's within us. Lord, don't, please don't pass me by on this one, God. I need you more than the air I breathe. I need you more than the food on my table. I need you more than the clothes on my back. I need you, oh God, don't pass me by. Desperate, everybody say desperate. desperate. Amen. So passivity can be your, to your destruction and human reasoning makes you miss your opportunity trying to reason things out in your computer with that analytical mind of yours. Amen. You, you have to analyze everything. Amen. And you know, we know two and two equals four and four and four equals eight. But you know, listen to me, with God, that's not always the case, is it? When the doctor says, I, I'm sorry, there's nothing else we can do, God says, good, I can. If we don't give up on him, if we don't let him pass us by, Amen. Are you listening to me? See, he comes when the desperate calls upon him. See, sometimes you've got to get desperate. You may have tried everything else, and you, you, got, you just got to get desperate. God said in Psalms 50, verse 15, he says, And call upon me in the day of trouble. He says, I will deliver thee, and, and thou shalt glorify me. Call upon me on the day of trouble. Did you get that? Anybody ever had a day of trouble? Call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver thee. And then what did he say? And thou shalt glorify me. How many of you know we're in debt when it comes to giving glory and praise to Almighty God? For the things that he's done, for the times he's come to our rescue, for saving us, my Lord. Every day we're to be thanking him for our salvation. Can I get a witness out there? But sometimes Jesus will pass you by. Now, we're all familiar with the woman with the issue of blood. We know about this woman. She spent all that she had on physicians for 12 years. Now, she must have been a wealthy woman, Mark. If her, if her finances lasted for 12 years, going to the doctors, she must have had a role that would choke, choke a mule. <laughs> Can I get a witness out there? But she spent all she had. And, and I always get a picture. When I think about this little woman, I can see her. She's so skinny and frail and pale she probably weighs about 75 or 80 pounds. But I can see her. The, the word says in Mark chapter 5, verse 27, and when she heard of Jesus, she came in the press behind and she touched his garment. Now, there's no doubt in the world, folks, there were many sick women in that crowd that was following Jesus. That's where they all came. There were many people who were sick. But one made a call. One made a call. This woman with the issue of blood, she touched his garment and she was healed immediately. I mean, listen, if you don't call out in prayer, the master will pass you by. You've got to cry out to him. You've got to make an effort to get to him. I mean, I see this little woman. She's down on all fours. She's heard about Jesus. She says, I've tried everything else. I've spent every dime I have on doctors, and yet I've grown worse. And if I can just but grin, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, if I can just tap into his authority, I know I'm going to be made whole, and I can see her reaching up. And here's all these people around Jesus, sick people, Brother Cabell, many people. And she touches him. And what does Jesus say? This blows my mind. Who touched me? Don't you know his disciples thought the boy's been out in the sun too long? He's having a heat stroke, no doubt. Because there's hundreds of people trying to touch him. And he said, who touched me? But it was that touch of faith, folks. It was that desperation. I've got to get to him because he's my only hope. I can't put my faith in doctors. I can't put my faith in anything else, in preachers, in denomination, in religion. I put my faith in God. He's the only one that can touch me and raise me up off this bed of affliction. So what are you saying? Jesus will sometimes pass you by, but you've got to cry out to him. You've got to. And a lot of times, folks, as we go through, as we go through this storm in our life, Jesus is not understood. In Matthew 6, verse 49, notice what it says. And when they saw him walking upon the sea, they, they didn't just rejoice, man. Oh, look, who, here comes Jesus walking on the sea. No, uh The word says they supposed it had been a spirit and they cried out. Amen. They thought they had seen a ghost. Can somebody say amen? 
They, Jesus was, was misunderstood there. See, in the storm, we, we make the mistake of working God out with our minds. Right here. We try to work it out in our mind. And, and, and this, the, mind is in, it's, the mind is childish, isn't it? It really is. Infantile. When it, when it comes to understanding the might and the authority of the Son of God, a lot of times our mind is childless, childful. And we try to work things out and analyze things in our mind. And what happened is unbelief rages. And I found this out. Unbelief really rages in a brilliant mind. That yeah. doesn't work on mine too, too good. <laughs> but I've seen people, these people with high IQs and very brilliant people, that's where unbelief rages, right between their two ears. They have that analytical mind, like I said, and everything's got to add up. You know, when it comes to faith, no, I don't want the faith stuff, you know. Everything's got to add up. And, and this is what happens, and unbelief rages in these minds. But, but we've got to believe God, and we've got to understand we believe God with our heart. And we believe that he's going to save us out of the storm that we're going through. I mean, we can't think our way out of this thing. We've got to believe God, don't we? In 1 Corinthians 2, 14, Paul said it best. He says, for the natural man, the flesh, the natural man, the carnal man, listen now, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Listen now. For they are foolishness unto him. Neither can they know him because they are spiritually discerned. I mean, there's people that will look at you and call you foolish because you would lift your hands and worship God and praise God. Amen, because of things that are happening, you begin to call the things that are not as though they were. They'd say, you are stupid, not ignorant, just plumb stupid. Amen? And, and this is what we see, folks. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness in them, neither can they know them, because they are spiritually discerned. I think about a man in the Bible. His name was Naaman. Naaman was a Syrian general. And the Bible tells us that, that Naaman had leprosy. Let me read it to you. In, in 2 Kings chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, and I want to read it to you from the NLT. It says, the king of Syria had great admiration for Naaman. Notice this, the commander of his army. He's a general, folks. Because through him the Lord had given Syria great victories. But through Naaman, but though Naaman was a mighty warrior, he suffered from leprosy, a leper. He had a terminal illness. He was going to die. So the Bible tells us at this time, Syrian raiders had invaded the land of Israel, and among their captives was a young girl who had been given to Naaman's wife as a maid. So they, cap they captured this young Israeli woman, and she was given to Naaman's wife as a maid to her. And the Bible goes on to say, it says, One day the girl said to her mistress, I wish my master would go to see the prophet in Samaria. He would heal him of his leprosy. And the word says that Naaman told the king what the young girl from Israel had said. Go and visit the prophet, the king of Syria told him. And listen what the king of Syria said. I'm going to send a letter of introduction for you to take to the king of Israel. So Naaman started out carrying as, as gifts 750 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. And a letter to the king of Israel said this, With this letter I present my servant Naaman. I want you to heal him of his leprosy. <laughs> I love the next verse. It says, and The king of Israel read the letter. He tore his clothes in dismay and he said, This man sends me a, a leper to heal. Am I God that I can give life and take it away? I can see what he's just, he's just trying to pick a fight with me. Huh? That's all he's trying to do. What can I do? I can't do anything for this man, but I love this. The word says that when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore the, his, his clothes and all. And then in verse 8, it says, When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes in dismay, he sent this message to him. Why are you so, so upset? Send Naaman to me, and, I will, and, and he will learn that there's a true prophet here in Israel. Now, how many of you know in order to have a false prophet, you first have to have a true prophet? Some folks say, I don't believe in prophecy anymore. I've seen too many false prophets. No, there has to be a real one to have a fake one. Amen. Amen. And when somebody prophesies over you and says, thus saith the Lord, don't be so quick to judge that. A lot of times I tell folks, just put it up on the shelf. And in time, either it'll come to fruition and you'll say, that was a man, a woman, a God. 
or you'll find out they were a false prophet or prophetess. Can I get a witness out there? So he's going to know there's a prophet in Israel. Verse 9 says, So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and waited at the door of Elisha's house. But Elisha sent a messenger out to him with this message. Go and wash yourself seven times in the Jordan River. Then your skin will be restored and you will be healed of your leprosy. How many of you know that went over like a lead balloon? The next verse says, but Naaman became angry. He stalked away and he thought he would certainly come out and meet me. He said this, I expected him to wave his hand over the leprosy and call on the name of the Lord, his God, and heal me. I mean, doesn't he know who I am? You ever met anybody like that? Don't look at your neighbor. Huh? Some people who are a legend in their own mind, right? Amen? And then he says this. Listen to what Naaman says. Aren't the rivers of Damascus and Abana and Farpar better than any of the rivers in Israel? Why shouldn't I wash in them and be healed? So Naaman turned and went away in a rage. He was madder than a junkyard dog. Huh? This man has insulted me. I've come all this way. I brought this silver. I brought this gold. I brought these fine threads for him to have. Come on. And he doesn't even come out here. He sends his servant out here. Next verse says this, but his officers tried to reason with him and said, sir, if the prophet had told you to do something very difficult, wouldn't you have done it? So you should certainly obey him when he says, simply go and wash and you be cured. So Naaman went down to the Jordan River. He dipped himself seven times as the man of God had instructed him, and his skin became as healthy as the skin of a young child, and he was healed. Then Naaman and his entire party went back to find the man of God. They stood before him, and Naaman said, Now I know there is no God in all the world except in Israel. So please accept the gift from your servant. But Elisha replied, As surely as the Lord lives, whom I serve, I will not accept any gifts and though Naaman urged him to take the gift, Elisha refused. Well, he wasn't like preachers today, was he? Huh? That's like the lady who called to church and she said to the, to the secretary, she said, I'd like to speak to the main hog of the trough. And the secretary said, I beg your pardon, ma'am. We don't call our pastor the main hog of the trough. We call him reverend. We call him pastor. We do not call him things like that. And the lady said, oh, I'm so sorry I offended you. She said, I am so sorry. Please forgive me. She says, I've got this $10,000 offering I wanted to give. And the lady said, hold on, ma'am. I see the big pig coming down the hallway now. Come on. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Elisha, he said, I don't want anything you got. Can I get a witness out there? But what do we see? We see that he was healed, folks. When you're in the storm of life, how many of you know that Jesus understands everything that we're going through? He really does. And also, listen to me, when you're going through the storm of life, Jesus' presence, let me tell you what it does, it removes all the fear. Anybody ever been plagued with fear? Huh? It, that's a terrible place to be. I've been there. I have. I've been there. Devils used to tell me all the time, when, especially when I first went in the ministry, and I've shared this with y'all, I'm going to kill you. He, I mean, it was just as plain as I'm telling y'all, I'm going to kill you. And I, it tore me up. Finally, I got to the place, and I said, you know, the Word says to live as Christ, to die is gain. So no matter what happens, I win. So, hey, devil, I don't really give a rip. Take your best shot. You know what? He stopped bothering me. He said, this man is, he's stupid. I can't do nothing with him. Amen? But Jesus' presence removes fear. Notice verse 50 of Mark 6. It says, for they all saw him, and they were troubled, or they were terrified. When they saw Jesus, he's walking on the water, they are terrified. And immediately, he talked with them, and he said to them, listen to what Jesus said to them. Be of good cheer. It is I. Notice what he said. Be not afraid. Did you get that? Don't be afraid. See, the storm, what it does, fear rages in the storm. And it will not be pacified by any means until Jesus comes, for he is alone. He alone has the, has the power, folks, to remove the greatest fears that we go through in our life. He's the only one that can do that. Jesus, listen, he's no psychologist or guru, but he's the creator of the heavens and the earth. He's the one that gives us that perfect peace that passes all understanding. His name is Jesus. He will remove that fear out of your life. And there are people who are scared to death. There are people actually who have not come out of their home since last March. 
a year ago. They're scared. They're terrified. That's a terrible place to live. In Psalms 27, 1, the word says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Listen to what David said. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Question mark. In other words, I don't, have, I don't need to be afraid of anything. Wow. You remember Jairus, he brought his daughter to Jesus. The man told Jesus that his daughter was at death's door. The Bible tells us that fear raged in the hearts of that man when he came, they came and told him, don't bother the master anymore, she's dead. She's dead. But Jesus called for Jairus and he told him, he said, just believe in me. Amen? He wasn't talking about positive thinking or some formula that some man has conjured up. He said, just believe in me. And that removes the fear. In Luke 8, verse 50, it says, And when Jesus heard it, when he heard that his daughter had died, he answered, answered him saying, Fear not, believe only, and she shall be made whole. Guess what? Jesus went and raised her from the dead, didn't he? He really did. This is what he can do. See, when you're in the storm of life, you need Jesus on board. When Jesus was in the ship with them, that's when the winds ceased. I want you to get this in your spirit today. The word says in verse 51 of our scripture text, of, uh, here in Mark chapter 6, it says, and he went up, notice this, he's walking on the sea, and the word says, and he went up unto them into the ship, and I love this, and the winds ceased. I want you to chew on that for a minute. Let me read it again. He went up unto them into the ship, and the winds ceased. How many of you have got him on board your vessel today? Huh? Well, when you've got him on board your vessel, guess what? The winds, they will cease. They will. They really will. And we have to understand that. The word says that they were sore amazing themselves beyond measure and they wondered. See, in the storm, our ship rocks and rolls. Amen. We don't need to be rocking and rolling. We need to be on the rocket, don't roll. Can somebody say amen? And the ship, sometimes it fills with water, with the waters of destruction. How many of you ever had to be bailing water out of your ship, spiritually speaking? You understand what I'm talking about? See, wisdom, it behooves each and every one of us that are distressed to invite the master on board. You need to invite the master on board your ship. You need to invite the master on board of your marriage. Can somebody say amen? You need to invite the master on board of your failing health when the doctor says we can't do anything else. You need to invite the master on board of your bankrupt business. Can somebody say amen? See, only then will those winds cease when you invite him on board of the situation that you're going through in your life. Whether it's physical, financial, or spiritual, when you invite him on board, you may still be having the problem, but there's that peace that passes all understanding. David said in Psalm 63 and verse 7, Because thou hast been my help, therefore in the shadow of thy wings I will rejoice. Because you've been my help in the shadow of your wings. That's walking close to God, isn't it? I'm going to rejoice. I'm going to rejoice. I think about the first miracle that Jesus ever performed. It was at a wedding in Cana of Galilee. And the Bible tells us in John chapter 2, verse 2 and 3, it says, And both Jesus was called, everybody say called, and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, Listen to what Mary said to her son Jesus. They have no wine. Now the wedding had a problem. There was no wine. But guess what? The invitation of Jesus to the wedding changed everything. Because Jesus was there at that wedding. The distressful and failing situation, it changed because he turned the water into wine. Guess what? He's the only solution to the ship that rocks on the storm. He's the only one that can bring a miracle. Amen? He's the only one that can turn a situation around. But he's got to be on board before that can happen. You've got to allow him to be on. When he climbed on board that ship, the wind ceased. Woo! I'm about to have church. Let me close with this. When you're in the storm of life, 
How many of you know that Jesus can do what he did yesterday? See, some of you live in yesterday. See, some of your testimonies are like this. Y'all pray for me. I'm so thankful I'm a Christian. Y'all pray for me that I get back close to God like I used to be. Pray I'll get as close to God. This is the one that gets me right here. Pray I'll get back as close to God as I was the day I got saved. Ooh. How many of you know that's not a good testimony? The day you got saved is the beginning. From there, you to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. Every day, we should be getting closer to God, not further away. Are you listening to me? So Jesus can do what he did yesterday. In the storm, he, he's the same yesterday. He's the same today. He's the same tomorrow. Can somebody say amen? In Mark 6, 52, the word, now listen to this. And they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. They, these are people who had walked with Jesus for three and a half years. They saw him do the miraculous. They were there, Cabell, Pastor Cabell, when he fed 5,000 men, not counting women and children, with five loaves and two fishes. Come on. They saw him do a miracle there. They saw him raise Lazarus from the dead. They saw him open blind eyes. They saw him do all of this, but here they are. They're out there on the ship. And, and what does this last verse says, uh, say here in verse 52? They considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. In other words, in the storm, it will bring your remembrance, folks, to the miracles that God has done for you in the past. I can't begin to tell you how many times I have drawn off the things that God has done in the past to relate to what I'm going through right now. When I'm going through bad things, I begin to say, Lord, I want to thank you for Oak Street in Alexandria, Virginia in 1969 when Garney Ewing got born again. <laughs> and I got born again. Amen. Has the devil ever told you you're not saved? Huh? You know, I've been a Christian 51 years, and he still at times tells me I'm not saved. You know what I tell him? I said, De devil, you are a... Dirty, low-down, good-for-nothing, stinking, rotten liar. Because I was there when it happened. Yeah. Amen? Has he ever told you you're not healed? Yeah. Huh? That's when you have to say, by faith, a lot of times, devil, you're a dirty, low-down, good-for-nothing, rotten, stinking devil because the Word says, by his stripes, we are healed and we were healed. Yeah. Amen? You have to, a lot of times, draw strength. Draw strength over the things he's done for you in the past. Because he's not, listen, he's not just a yesterday God. He's a right now God. Can I get a witness out there? So they consider not the miracle of the loaves. Amen. See, when we remember the things he's done in the past, what this does, it will kindle the dying flame of the human spirit. It will kindle that some of you ain't got enough flame to flick your bit. Come on. Are you listening to me? See, you've got to renew your confidence in the fact that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and he'll be the same tomorrow and forever. You've got to renew your confidence in God. Jesus can do what he did yesterday. That's why in Hebrews 10, 35, he said this, Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. Now, let me just ask you a question. Who's your confidence in? Huh? Well, let me just tell you one thing. If you put your confidence in Pastor Roger, you're on a sinking ship. Because you've heard me say this many times. I'll fail you because I'm human. If you put your confidence in a denomination, you're on a sinking ship. If you put your confidence in a prophet, evangelist, pastor, a teacher, you're in a sinking ship. You better put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ. Because he, listen, he'll come on board your sinking ship. He really will. Our confidence is in him. In 1 Samuel 17, 37, David remembered what God had done for him yesterday and did for him yesterday. The word says in verse 37, David said, moreover, the Lord, listen to what he said now, has delivered me out of the paw of the lion, out of the paw of the bear. And he looks at Goliath and he says, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And King Saul said to David, go, and the Lord be with thee. <laughs> uh, 
The king said, all right, buddy, go, and the Lord be with thee. But what did he do? He drew strength. He remembered when he went up against that lion, and he tore him, rent him like a lamb. He remembered how he went up against the bear, and he killed the bear. He said, if I could kill a lion through the power of the Holy Spirit, and if I could kill a bear through the power of the Holy Spirit, I can certainly go up against this 13-foot, 6-inch, uncircumcised Philistine. And he did, didn't he? With five smooth stones. And the only place that there was no armor was right here. And he let it go with that slingshot. Caught him right there. Killed him. And he went and cut his head off. See, the giant he faces today will overcome by this. Is overcome the same way God helped David kill the lion and the bear in days that were gone by. That same, that same giant that we face today, God is able to, to take care of that. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying confidence is renewed in our remembrance. Confidence is renewed in our remembrance. There's some things we never should ever forget. We should never forget the day we got born again. I want you to just close your eyes for a minute. I want you to just meditate for a minute. I'm not talking about getting up and crossing your legs and sitting here and shave your head with a ponytail and going home. That's not what meditation is. Come on. I want you to think about what God's done in your life. I want you to think about the first encounter you ever had with Jesus. Think about that. Do you remember? You remember the first encounter? Actually, I had an encounter with the Lord before I ever got saved. How'd you have an encounter with the Lord before you got saved? It's called conviction. My Lord, I was having an encounter with Him and didn't even know it. His Holy Spirit was dealing with me. As a young teenage boy, I'm thinking about heaven and I'm thinking about hell. And I ain't hardly ever been to church in my life. I'm strung out out there on drugs, playing in a rock and roll band, and the Holy Spirit starts dealing with me and convicting me, and I'm, being, I'm thinking about dying? How many of you know that's not normal for an 18-year-old to sit around thinking, I could die, and where would I go? That was the encounter I was having with the Holy Spirit. He was convicting me, trying to convince me that I needed Jesus in my life. So one thing I'll never, ever forget, if I live to be 100, and I don't really know if I want to live to be 100, only if I've got good health and a right mind. Other than that, I'd rather go on home. But I will never forget that night when the altar call was given and the Lord was dealing with me and my girlfriend I peeked, and the preacher said, those of you that raise your hand, get up here. I, I had too much pride to raise my hand. Huh. When I looked up, and my sweet thing was running to the altar. My heart was about to beat out of my chest. And I got up, and I don't remember a whole lot after that. I got to that altar, and Jesus miraculously saved me. There was no doubt when I got up from that altar. I know we received Jesus by faith, but he gave me the feeling that goes along with it. I mean, honestly, folks, I've been high on a lot of things. But I'd never experienced anything like that. I'll tell you what it felt like. It felt like I got a hold of a 220. It was electricity. And it was flowing through me. And I can remember, honestly, I can remember... At the altar, I, I set up like this on the altar, from the altar, and I did this. What is this? It was the presence of God that was eating me alive. And the devil coming to me, you're not saved. I said, too late. How, an experience outweighs an argument. Come on. So we remember. We draw confidence by remembering what Jesus has done in the past. Now, some of you have no confidence in God. And you want me to tell you why? Because he had never done anything for you. Some people come to church, it's just a religious thing. They, hear, they come to church, they hear nothing, see nothing, feel nothing, and do nothing. 
They come to church and occupy a pew. But they've never had a genuine experience with Jesus Christ. They know of him. They've been born in a Christian family and, and maybe even received a Christian education. But they don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. And that's why when the storm of life comes, why a lot of people throw in the towel and quit. Because they have no one to look to, no one to turn to. Some of you are in that boat today. But God can get you out of that boat. He can put you in the lifeboat. Can somebody say amen? He can change your life. Would you bow your heads right where you are? We're going to leave those that are live streaming. We love you. We miss you. We're looking for you back soon. Thank you for allowing us to come where you are today. If you have a need, you let us know. We promise to pray for you. If you're watching you don't know Christ, we pray that you'll open up your heart's door right there where you are and then say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. I confess them to you. Come in. He will come in. He'll change you from the inside out. He'll make a new creature out of you. Thank you for joining us. Please join us again next time. And God bless you. Heads bowed.